Good evening, everyone. I show 502. Welcome to tonight's webinar, Drought 2020, Let's Talk About Soil Health. My name is Katie Getz, and I work at the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. And as we wait for a few more people to trickle in, if you've not already done so, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat box. If you've got a question already for our presenters, go ahead and key that in. If there's a soil health resource that, uh, resource that you lean on, please share it in the chat box as well. And you should see on your screen uh, a rundown of tonight's presentation, starting with Jimmy Emmons, he'll be our first speaker, Steve Cadis, and we'll wrap up with Dave Dubois providing a weather update. During these presentations, we invite you to enter your questions into the chat, and Katie Steele from USDA Southwest Climate Hub will be monitoring that, and we'll get to a question and answer session later on this evening. You might be wondering, what is the Drought Learning Network? It's a network of agencies and nonprofits with an interest in drought, as well as various resources related to drought. So tonight, the Drought Learning Network partners uh, will present, a uh, represented here include New Mexico Department of Agriculture, Southwest Climate Hub, which is part of USDA, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and several others. And the network's aim is to combine all these resources for the betterment of the public, including agricultural producers, in order to help you better prepare for, respond to, and recover from drought. So tonight's webinar is on soil health, which relates to increasing resilience to drought. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And his name is Jimmy Emmons. Jimmy is a farmer and a rancher with his family in Dewey County, Oklahoma. He utilizes no-till, cover crops, and planned grazing management in order to decrease soil erosion and increase water infiltration. He tests both the soil and plant tissues to monitor soil fertility, and he's active in conservation activities at both the district and the state levels. Jimmy was appointed by U.S. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue to serve as the Southern Plains Regional Coordinator of FPAC. You might be wondering, what is FPAC? The Farm Production and Conservation Outfit within USDA, and it oversees Farm Service Agency, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and Risk Management Agency. And that outfit covers Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, and Kansas. With that, Jimmy? You bet. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, try to get the screen up and going here. Yes, and as you get your screen shared there, Jimmy, I'll just offer the reminder to attendees that we are indeed recording tonight's presentation, meaning it will be available later on um, the Southwest, Southwest Climate Hub's website. Thank you. You bet. So good afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, glad you could join us today, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about 2020 drought and soil health. Uh, you know, what can we do? How can we improve? Uh, and how can we be resilient? Uh, you know, right here where I'm at in Northwest Oklahoma right now, we're experiencing a, a, a pretty severe drought. Uh, if you look on the drought monitor, uh, there's a little circle kind of in Southwest, uh, Northwest Oklahoma, while I'm kind of in that area. And uh, we're as dry as we were in uh, 11 and 12, I believe, uh, it seems so. We're, we know all about drought here and uh, it's not the first for us. Uh, but, you know, eight years ago, I made the commitment to, to change things on our operation and to uh, try to be more resilient, try to learn more about soil health. And wow, what a, what a great adventure it's been thus far. And uh, my wife, Ginger and I uh, farm and ranch uh, here in Northwest Oklahoma. And we have one time full employee with us so back in uh, 2011, I heard uh, this, this guy in uh, Carroll County, uh, Ohio, talking, Dave Brandt, about how he was able to change his farm and uh, what he could do with cover crops. <clears throat> and it really inspired me. And uh, I came home and I, I thought about that. And uh, well, you know, where, where do I start? How do I go from here? Uh, and so I reached out to my NRCS friends, my Oklahoma Conservation District friends and commission friends and Noble Research. And we all partnered up and uh, we started down this road together to learn together and to try to keep everybody going, I guess, to 
in the group because I feel like the team effort's always better. The first thing we found out was on my farm that our infiltration rate was about a half inch an hour. And, and I was seeing that in our irrigation. I've got a couple of pivots along the river uh, and uh, we knew that that wasn't right. And, and I have lots of irrigation friends across the country that will put on a half inch to maybe up to an inch per pass. But in our region, an area in the summertime, our evaporation rate can be anywhere from a half inch to three quarters of an inch. And so it really got me to thinking, uh, you know, that that's not really gaining much and I'm not very efficient. And so I started to, to uh, go down the road to soil health and start planting some cover crops. And this is the, the very first time I, I planted a cover crop into a, a stubble field. And I, in my own mind at that day, in that moment in time, I thought to myself, this is not gonna work because I have very little limited water to grow one crop. You know, how am I gonna grow uh, 365 in between, I'm gonna have a cover in between my cash crops. You know, how's that gonna work? And so I really started wanting to focus on water use of the cover crops uh, and, and really track that. And so that's one thing that Noble Research and NRCS and everybody helped me with. Uh, I bought some uh, water probes and stuff. And so we started uh, down that road to watching everything. And uh, this is my first cover crop in 2012. And now remember, we're in a, a huge D3, D4 drought shortly uh, after this. We were in D2 to going into three at this time when I took this picture. This is behind a, a, a harvested grain crop. And uh, it, it looked so beautiful. Now, it only got about waist high and then it started really suffering and, and the drought persisted. But what I quickly learned that year, and I left a bare uh, spot out in this field, just like I would have used to have left it clean till plowed, uh, I left it. And uh, lo and behold, later that summer, we found out that I had more water in the profile where my cover crop was growing than where the bare ground was. And it was a real, real eye opener uh, to Jimmy Emmons. And uh, that I'll never forget that day uh, when Jim Johnson, Noble Research, uh, came out and he, he had a probe and he probed down in that square and he hit a, a very hard layer. And he said, well, Jimmy, you've got a hard pan here. And I, I told him, I said, no, Jim, I, I, I don't. I, I know this soil and I, I've known it a long time. And so he probed another time or two and then he went out into the cover crop and the probe went all the way in. And uh, so we knew something was up and uh, NRCS came the following week and we pulled some cores and what he was hitting was a dry layer uh, down about 16 inches and it was 36 inches to the dry layer uh, in the cover crop. So it was a, that was the game changer, the aha moment uh, for Jimmy Emmons on his farm uh, in the middle of the worst drought that we'd had since the 30s. And uh, so I'm, I've never looked back uh, since then. This is the second year uh, here in a, in a different field. And, and a lot of people say this is my cheater field. I, I do have a pivot irrigation in this field. But uh, since then, I only use irrigation to supplement uh, when we're in a dry period. And I've been able to cut my irrigation back uh, way, way back until this, this past, this summer right now, we're irrigating more than we've irrigated in a long time. But uh, the, the neat thing about this is, uh, this is what really started uh, us on another road and NRCS is getting ready to uh, reclassify the soil in this field. And uh, we're really, really excited about that. It's changed that much in eight years. And that's what we see is the better the soil is, the less we have degraded it, uh, and it was better to start with, the quicker it can turn around. And uh, it's pretty exciting. This field here, we just got done uh, doing some big infiltration tests with NRCS and the commission on. So uh, about three weeks ago now, uh, they came out, and we put seven inches of water on in about two hours. So I parked the pivot still, 
and just let it run. And uh, we run the gauge over uh, seven inches at, at a little past the second hour. Um, and as I was going down to shut the pivot off, it, it dawned on me that there is no running water, there is no standing water. And uh, it just it just really blew me away that we put that much water on uh, in that time period and uh, we didn't have anything standing. So got all excited. The, they decided to come back uh, two weeks later and do a, uh, a film of that with a time lapse video. So we put another seven inches on in the same spot uh, in the field. Now, in the meantime, I have corn in that field. And so I irrigated uh, a couple more passes in that two week uh, window. So we had 17 inches uh, on in two weeks. And uh, that last seven inches went in in 20 minutes. Uh, and so it, it was a real eye opener again uh, of how much we can take in. And I'm gonna have that video out uh, in the very near future of a time lapse uh, scenario. So you'll be able to, to really see that. This is the setup we had. So in my, in my, I always have these experiments going on in, on the farm. Uh, so I was trying to some uh, Jimmy red corn and some Tommy boy here and I run out of seed uh, in this particular spot. And so it was a good place to do the, the filming. And so that's an old uh, wagon wheel that a friend of mine has, it's four foot across. Uh, we set that down, uh, there's a rain gauge in the middle of it. You see the camera out there, uh, We've got another camera on the sprinkler up above there to, to, to filming. Now we're at about four inches in when I took this picture. Uh, and so you, you see there's no water uh, standing there and uh, there's no water running at all. So it was a, a really good experiment. Uh, I, I'm going to, uh, in this field, after we harvest corn, I'm gonna really find out exactly how much I can take in before we go to running water out of the field, uh, but but not yet. Uh, it, now you can see the strip where I run out, uh, and that's the reason it was a good place to run. In the forefront of this picture, you'll see a little dab of standing water right there where we drove in. Uh, now we put, like I said, seven inches on, and if you'll notice the NRCS pickup setting there has to come out this way. And uh, my soil scientist, Steve Osball, was prety worried about that. And I said, Steve, I don't have that issue because if you'll notice, there's no irrigation ruts uh, there as well. And so he was able to drive right out of that field with no problem because the water is moving down uh, so fast. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to see how vertical movement is happening so fast in this field now. This is a, a few weeks before that. We, we uh, had this, that's before I planted the corn right after we harvested the wheat. And uh, we were noticing how fast the infiltration was going down. And that's when the, the thought process came about, you know, let's try to measure uh, what's going on here. Now this is a very sandy loam soil. It's a fairly new soil, uh, less than 500 years old. So it, it was always very light in color. Uh, uh, very porous, uh, very wind blown. Uh, there is some uh, sand deposits from the river uh, in this field of very heavy white sand. But you can tell here by the color of that, how we've been able to change that and really load that with carbon for the past eight years. And so it's been uh, really, really exciting uh, to watch this grow. And so I've ha had cover crops in between cash crops and I always graze them cover crops. So I've I practice all the soil health principles by adding animals to that as well as keeping it covered. Um, and part of this challenge is people told me that I couldn't plant corn in Western Oklahoma because we're too hot and uh, we couldn't grow up because of alpha toxin and uh, you dang sure can't plant it behind uh, cereal rye or a grain crop because your nitrogen will be tied up. Uh, I have no synthetic in on that cover crop or on that corn crop. Uh, there behind that cereal rye, uh, and it's it's doing quite well. It's for the corn guys that might be listening. It's uh, 16 round and 44 long, so pretty pretty good ears on that. Here's my state soil scientist Steve Allspaw and our our state uh, soil health coordinator, 
Amy Seeger. And uh, so we've, we've put the water on now and we've been digging around and look. And uh, I, I'm gonna zoom in here in a minute, but what really caught my eye as soon as Steve pulled that up, if you'll notice in his hand, that chunk of soil, there's two different colors in that. And uh, it was a real eye opener and uh, was very excited to, to see that. But I couldn't have done any of this without the teamwork of all the organizations that's helped me uh, through the years. And Steve would tell you that he challenged me in the early years uh, almost weekly to try something new, to try grazing. And then before long in the second and third year, I was calling him and challenged him, we need to do this, we need to try this. So it's been a really exciting uh, uh, adventure for us to go through. You know, in the original soil survey mapped this soil as a, uh, and, and Steve will have to correct me here in a little while, uh, used to live in. Uh, they were very young soils, uh, very light. Uh, and it's typically, uh, you didn't see the dark surface that you see uh, eight years ago, and Steve commented on that. Uh, today, you see what uh, a mollic uh, looking soil, and they're going to uh, reclassify that to fluventic the soil and uh, that's that's very huge if you're in the soils very much and that's maybe Steve will comment on that a little bit later uh, this here's from the grids sampling uh, that we started this is all soil organic matter uh, so in when we started in 2012 in 2014 I pulled another grid and if you'll see over there on the left four tenths to eight tenths percent uh, was in most of the field. That is very, very low organic matter. Uh, but within two years, uh, look what changed. And, and I've steadily progressed that uh, along. And there's, I've been challenged several times uh, that you can't do it this fast. Uh, if you practice the soil health principles and you have some water, you can do great things. Now, in my drier soils where I don't have irrigation, it's a slower process, I will tell you. But now I have some of that green area that's in 3% almost, and, and most of it is 3%. Here's that picture I was talking about a while ago that Steve had in his hand. Now, on the right, that's what my surface used to look like. Uh, and on the left is what my surface looks like now. That is moving down pretty steadily about an inch to inch and a half a year. And uh, then below, and it broke off, we couldn't get this all hold together. Uh, below that light colored, another dark layer uh, undisturbed down below the original plow pan of about 12 to 13 inches. So I just like about five inches uh, in this profile of getting back where we started from uh, in the 30s, uh, in the 20s there. So as you can see, the, the, the change in the soil from a very light colored uh, now to a very dark, uh, uh, not as porous. It is porous, but it's, it's, it's totally different. It doesn't have the sand look uh, that it has, and it's, it's very exciting to see that happening uh, on your own place now. Uh, in Steve's 30-year career, uh, he's, he's never seen this kind of change uh, very often. It, it's only when a producer goes into a soil health management system. And, and when we talk about a systems approach, it's not just about planting a cover crop. It's, it's, it's not uh, one single thing. It's about the five principles of soil health, keeping it covered, keeping the living root in the ground as long as you can, uh, making it very diverse. Uh, we want multiple crops, multiple species of covers, and there as much diversity is. I try not to plant the same uh, crop in the same field but every four or five years to keep the rotation up, uh, to watch my carbon in the ground. We've also put animals on the ground uh, in these fields now. And uh, uh, for an instance, right now I'm grazing summer covers that literally were burned up uh, a month ago and we caught just a small inch shower and uh, uh, they really greened up and so we got some good grazing right now. This is that corn I was talking about. This has zero synthetic uh, fertilizer on it. It's following a, a cereal grain crop that we harvested. 
Uh, all this has had on this is some compost tea extracts on the seed and then some uh, molasses and humix over the top. Uh, and uh, it's, it's doing very well. Uh, people challenge me that you can't do that. But if you look at that, that leaf tissue, uh, you'll see that this plant's not struggling uh, at all for nutrients. Uh, and a lot of that is due to our organic matter is, is steadily climbing. And it, as it climbs, so does your nutrients availability in the soil. So our, our biology is doing a lot better job for us breaking things down. And it's, it's really exciting. You also see that I've got crabgrass, I've got cereal rye coming in that uh, as a great cover. You saw that in the, the photographs prior to. Uh, as soon as we harvest this, this is a double crop, so it's gonna be later, uh, but we will graze that. Uh, and we'll have green growing uh, undergrowth in there. We'll have some grain and, and fodder for the cattle eat. And it's a really, uh, uh, really good uh, process. So, you know, the, the question is uh, living on the land uh, versus the land living on you. Uh, this double crop corn, uh, like I said, uh, has very little inputs about it. So uh, even with cheap corn prices, I can, uh, I uh, can make a profit. And you're seeing that uh, we're taking up the ammonium and amino acids in this. Uh, the, most people don't understand when you put fertilizer on, it still has to go through the biology and it still has to be broken down before the plant can take it up. And so why do all that if you can uh, get that process going ahead of time and have it available? And so it's, it's really been a great learning curve for us. So how important is soil aggregation and soil health? Well, it's everything. Uh, it's, it's literally everything. Uh, when we're talking about drought, uh, if you go into a drought uh, with a full soil profile of water, you can grow more longer than, than if you don't. But also, what normally happens when you come out of a drought or during a drought, we have these large uh, rain events. So you still have to be able to capture it. So it's everything. It's, it's improved infiltration, it's water holding capacity, it's carbon storage. Um, you know, if we can take an eight or 10 inch rainfall event and take it all in, or at least most of it, look at the multiple benefits that we can have to grow future crops. My nutrients that I have in my field stay in my field, my soil stays in place. And it, literally, there's more to the pie than just the crust. There's lots of ingredients when you go to talking about a soil health system. And that's what I'm all about, is, is the systems approach, uh, trying to uh, go at it in a, in a thinking process instead of the easy button process uh, that we used to. And uh, think about, try multiple crops, and, and I know a lot of people say, well, we just don't have the water, but you, you do have if you build that aggregation because you can store it. Now, if it never rains, it, it's really not gonna matter. I understand that, but we can less, lessen the impact of drought and we can uh, help in the flooding events if you get your soil right. So I'm gonna stop there, to, my time's up, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Steve a little bit. I'm very excited about his project. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jimmy. A lot of good story to tell there and a lot of good photographs to substantiate it. So maybe uh, you can key in some of your social media handles into the chat box so folks can find you as, as they're online this evening. So again, if, you're, if you joined us just a few minutes late, no worries. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available later on USDA Southwest Climate Hub website. Uh, also within the chat box, we invite you to key in your questions, both for Jimmy and for our next speaker, who is Steve Cadis. So we'll give Steve a moment to get teed up here as I offer an introduction about him. So Steve Cadis works for USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service as the state resources conservationist. He's based in Albuquerque, and he supervises the Ecological Sciences Division. Steve focuses on technology and conservation planning assistance for everything from soil health to archeology span and from range management to water quality. He's worked for NRCS in Cheyenne, Wyoming and in several places in New Mexico, including Estancia, Clovis and Albuquerque. 
She currently serves on the board of directors of the Soil and Water Conservation Society. Steve? Thank you, Katie, appreciate it. Um, so um, I'm happy to be here tonight and I just want to welcome everybody to be here. It's, uh, it's always great to, to come and talk about soil health and to see what other people are doing. I'm always impressed to see what uh, new things that Jimmy is up to. And uh, he's helped me out with my presentation tonight and you'll see a little bit about that. But I kind of I stole the name of the, of the presentation and, uh, and, and called it, let's talk about soil aggregates. And really, I want to pick up where, where Jimmy left off because Jimmy talked about some important things about uh, um, uh, infiltration and the importance of having a soil with good infiltration. So I'm going to pick up from there and uh, we'll go on. And some of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight was how so healthy soils function. And Jimmy touched on a lot of those things. Uh, I want to quickly explore the basics of uh, the soil health principles. And um, I want to see if we can demonstrate the importance of soil aggregation. Jimmy already uh, touched on that pretty good about the importance of it. And then maybe a little bit about exploring uh, drought runoff and reduced store water storage and, and how aggregation affects those types of things. So I, I want to start off by talking about what soil health is. And this is the definition that, that we use, that NRCS uses, and it's the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And the key point to this is it functions, soil functions as a vital living ecosystem. It's a living ecosystem that's important for us to, that concept for us to grasp. As we, um, as we jump into the soil health principles, uh, there's a variety of different principles. NRCS uses four principles. Uh, one of them is really uh, the fifth one, and that's incorporating uh, uh, grazing or livestock grazing or animal grazing. But uh, the four principles uh, go like this. Uh, the first one is to minimize the disturbance of the soil. Second one is maximize soil cover. The third is maximize biodiversity, and this is where grazing comes in, and incorporate grazing. And the fourth, extremely important, all of them are important. You can't do soil health without, without all of these but I always focus on maximizing living roots in the soil and you'll, fi and you'll find out why. And it just, it just links right into uh, to what, uh, to what we're gonna be talking about today. So all of these principles are common to all soils. It doesn't matter where you're at, if you're on the East Coast, if you're in the Midwest, in the West, if you're in uh, France, Belgium, China, all of these principles are common to all soils. And these principles are only a reflection of what soil does naturally and normally. So in an, uh, a natural uh, undisturbed soil, you're gonna see all these principles. So all of this is, is just a reflection of what, um, of what uh, soils just naturally do. And our goal in, in managing the soil and having a soil health management system is to get as close to these principles as, as we can and identify, hey, where are we far off from these things? So we want to identify where, where do we need some help, where do we need to get closer, and then work on those things. And those are some of the things that Jimmy has talked a lot about it, is how he's worked on uh, improving his soil health. So there's a, couple of, there's a couple of roles and functions. The main roles of, uh, of the soil health principles are uh, is to feed and protect the soil. Soil needs to be uh, fed and it needs to be protective. Some of the key benefits, and there's many key benefits, but I like to focus in on these, these top two because they're so important to us, especially in, these, in, uh, in the Southwest where we live and where water is on such high demand. 
in short supply. So the key functions is to store water and to cycle nutrients. These are, these are key functions. Nobody can, can argue that these things aren't important. So a departure, any departure from any of these principles tends to degrade the roles and the functions and the benefits that we can get from the soil. So going in a little bit deeper, uh, when you look at this circle or this pie uh, that this, uh, of this, uh, this graphic that we use, uh, you'll see that there's two different parts to it. So the left hand, the left half is, is how we feed and fuel the soil. So maximizing continuous roots and maximizing biodiversity feeds the soil and it feeds the biology. And it's really the biology and the ecosystem that drives the soil health process. So you need to feed what's going to be your, your driver. On the right side, we see two, the two different uh, principles, minimize disturbance and maximize soil cover. These are the protecting parts of, uh, of soil health. So you, you minimize disturbance, you don't, you don't you try and mess up the soil as little as possible, that you know, calls for tillage and whatever things that might disturb the soil, but also to put a cover on it. And I like to think of the, the cover as, as the roof of the soil. Uh, you wouldn't want to uh, remove the roof off of your house every year. You do that, uh, it gets, starts to get cold and windy and the rain comes in and it's not the perfect uh, um, environment or ecosystem to live in. So let's don't take the, the roof off of the soil. Let's keep a cover on there. And let's don't disturb the house by taking the roof off. So protection. So we so the soil, the key roles are to feed and to protect the soil. So maximize living roots. I'm just going to jump to maximizing living roots. Why on earth would we want to do that? And the answer is, is because the carbon that we get from these living roots is the heart of soil health. It, it always surprises me, and I was just flabbergasted when I first learned this, that a growing plant provides one half to three quarters of their photosized carbon to the soil through the living roots. Uh, that's, we, we refer to that as liquid carbon. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, a plant would grow and it would produce carbohydrates and we'd use that to grow and put on leaves and stalks and, and seeds and, and, and grain. And they were using all of that carbohydrate for that purpose. That's not so. At least half to three quarters of it is leaking out of the roots and that, and that, uh, that liquid carbon is going into the soil and going into the, uh, the microbes that are in the soil. So that liquid carbon, and this is another surprising fact, is that that liquid carbon builds soil organic matter five to 30 times faster than putting in above ground biomass or adding compost. You know, a lot of times we think, well, if I just put a lot of compost on, if I put on a lot of mulch and, uh, and maybe mix that in a little bit, we think that all of that biomass that's on top of the soil breaks down and gets into the soil. And the, and the fact is, is that that's just not true. Most of that, a lot of that does get into the soil, uh, but relatively speaking, very little of it becomes soil organic matter. Most of it turns back into carbon dioxide and goes back into the atmosphere. So really the key to getting organic matter in the soil is through a living root that is going to leak that liquid carbon directly into the soil. So another interesting fact is liquid carbon accounts for 75% of the soil organic matter. So whenever you look in the soil, and Jimmy was showing um, his, his soil sample there where he had the dark and the light soil, 75% um, of that uh, organic matter that made that soil so dark was coming from those living roots. And the, so I say all this because the living root is really the site where soil health begins and develops. 
And why does that, why does that happen? It's because that carbon is energy and it's fuel that drives that ecosystem. Remember we talked about how uh, a, a soil is a vital living uh, ecosystem. And when we get that concept down, we start to see how important it is, is to have a living root in there. Because if it's living, it needs food. If it's living, it needs to be protected. And so by having that, that fuel going in there, we can build uh, soil organic matter and feed the soil. This picture over on the side, and I have to thank Jimmy for this because this is Jimmy's picture. It's one of my favorite pictures. And on this picture, um, well, Jimmy was out in this field one day and he was checking out his soil as he loves to do. And uh, as he was poking through it and digging through it, he, he brought up a clod. And as he opened up this clod, there was a, a root channel, or I should say a worm channel uh, that was going down through the soil and a root was following that worm channel. And, uh, and actually the worm channel was, was a lot bigger than the root. And uh, the root was just growing through there and not all of it was in contact of soil. So what you see in this is the, is the main root and then all of these root hairs, these tiny little root hairs coming off and, uh, and uh, not even in the soil yet. They're still reaching out, trying to get to the edge of the wall of the, uh, of the, of the wormhole. But the, the important thing and the interesting thing is to look at those droplets that's on those root hairs. These droplets right here, are that liquid carbon. This is the, the sugars that the, produ that the plant has produced. And it's, and it's continuously pumping these sugars into the soil. Now, if this was in contact with, with the soil right here, there would be uh, bacteria all around it and they would be thriving and colonizing all around those different root hairs and colonizing all around this root. And, and this is the site where and because of this, this is why this is a site of where soil health really starts to take off and really starts to develop and build. And when this happens, you have the colonization of bacteria and, and fungus, and you have what's called a rhizosheath starting to form around that, around that, uh, that root. And uh, here we have a picture here. This is a, of, a, of a range grass that was pulled out. This is from New Mexico. And you can see a lot of those roots that are out there. And those roots are not bare. They are actually covered in a sheath of soil. And the way that that happens is as those bacteria start to colonize and, and uh, feed on the, on the liquid carbon that's leaking, leaking out of those roots, these bacteria form colonies and these colonies produce uh, glues and goos and stuff like that and they start to uh, glue the soil particles together until you have a, the, the root is completely is completely encircled in these what we call rhizosheaths and there you start having this dynamic uh, relationship between the root and between the bacteria as the bacteria are eating the food they're dissolving uh, nutrients in the soil they're producing and pulling out nitrogen out of the, of the atmosphere. They're fixing nitrogen and they're feeding that back into the root. So you have this back and forth relationship and a real dynamic relationship that's going on here. And as that happens, we start to have the development of these rhizosheaths. And as these rhizosheaths grow, you start to have aggregates that are forming. And if you look you look down below the bottom of this of this root, you can see this big old clump that's on the bottom of it. And you can see below that some little clumps uh, hanging off of those, off of these roots. These are aggregates right here. And uh, these aggregates are extremely, are extremely important uh, because of the, the things that Jimmy was talking about. These aggregates are really what help build and improve that infiltration in the soil. So moving along aggregates, this is one of my favorite pictures because we can get a good picture of the, the types and the variety and the sizes of different aggregates. You can look in here and see different crumbs and clumps of soil in here. Uh, what's so important about, about aggregates? Our aggregates are storage reservoirs. 
they, they store different things. The main things that they store are water and they store nutrients. They also store carbon. So when you look at this and you see an aggregate, it's not just a clump or uh, a ball of something, but it is an extremely active site where you have uh, uh, colonies of uh, bacteria growing in here. And these are reservoirs for water. If we don't have aggregates, then we're not gonna have good infiltration and we're not gonna have a good robust water holding capacity in the soil. So aggregates, they promote uh, and improve uh, water infiltration by building soil, uh, a stable soil structure. Uh, when we um, build aggregates, we have micropores and, and, uh, and macropores. Macropores drain the water through the soil and deliver the water to the aggregates. Um, aggregates effectively hold water against uh, evaporation. They don't just sit there waiting for the water to evaporate off, but they're holding uh, somewhat tightly to that water and holding it um, for a plant root that may be coming by. Uh, these aggregates promote uh, water and, and air movement and, and water deep into the soil. That's what Jimmy was explaining, what he got from, uh, from the work that he's been doing is that deep water going in and moving in quickly. These are sites of very high mi micro, uh, uh, microbial activity and these are sites for carbon sequestration. So when we talk about putting organic matter in the soil, this is where most of the organic matter is being built and it's being stored is right here in these aggregates. Um, they're also in, in a be redundant, they're nutrient storage sites and they're uh, cycling sites. So we're, where we can cycle nutrients and store nutrients. Uh, so we've kind of already gone through this, uh, macropores infiltrate, micro, micropores and aggregates store water and hold on to it. They also promote uh, root growth by making it easy for roots to grow in. Uh, they provide space and channels for roots, energy. Uh, plants have to spend less energy on breaking through uh, hard pans and collapsed soils and compacted soils, and they move freely and grow freely through the soils. Um, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is that roots thrive in aggregated soils. And the thing, I guess, since we're talking about drought is that uh, when we have poor aggregation, um, that multiplies the effect of a drought. Uh, here's a diagram right here of, uh, of uh, soils a soil with macropores and micropores and aggregates. You see the blue lines and snakes that are coming down. These are the macropores and where infiltration is bringing water down into the soil. And you see these little groups of, uh, of uh, sand uh, particles and uh, water, water droplets. As this water is moving down, these uh, aggregates are absorbing this water. And so this is basically what we're shooting for, and this is what Jimmy's experiencing in his, in his, uh, in his uh, crops that he's growing at. Her. So some of the take home thoughts that I want to leave you with is that poor aggregation increases runoff and reduces water storage. So when we talk about drought, if we don't have good aggregation, um, we, create, we create a drought on steroids. Yeah, it's bad enough having a drought, but if you don't have those aggregates that are going to hold on tighter to that water and be able to receive that water when it does come, we have just taken a bad situation and made, and made it many times worse. So some of the things that affect that is good grazing. Um, good, good grazing management promotes water getting into the soil. Uh, it increases uh, water stored in the soil and increases the time that, that water stays in the soil. And I, the reason I say good grazing is because grazing can really supercharge and accelerate your soil, uh, your soil health. By, so by having a good uh, grazing system and management, you can, you can really accelerate your soil health. And you can do it without grazing, but with grazing, you, uh, you are really accelerating uh, that infiltration and the building of, of aggregates. So I guess the, the main thing is that, boy, if we want to be resilient against 
against a drought, we have to know what the soil health principles are and focus on uh, ensuring our soils use those uh, principles so that we can be resilient against um, droughts. And when we don't have a drought, we can be highly productive and highly profitable and successful uh, in what we do. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say. Jimmy, I want to thank you for your picture. Uh, I just, I love talking about it. And it says, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and that one sure is. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, appreciate, you, uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you, Steve, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Katie Steele, and I'm with the USDA Southwest Climate Hub, and I'm here to help host the question and answer session. So I don't see any questions in the chat box yet. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? I'll give you all a moment to think, and um, as soon as you have a question, type it into the chat box, or you can text me on the number I sent via email. I see one from Sonia Chavez. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, Sonia asks, what are the presenter's opinions about potential impacts of implementing demand management on health, soil health long term? Could you repeat that? <laughs> Sure. Um, what are the presenters' opinions about the potential impacts of implementing demand management on soil health? And that's in the long term. You go start, Boy, Steve. I don't really. I full no, I, I, I guess I guess I will, and I'll start by saying I'm not exactly sure what impacts of implementing demand management. I don't know what that, what that means. So, um, Sonia, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask the question. Let me just find you in. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm referring to the, the upper and lower basin states are talking about implementing a demand management program in Colorado and um, obviously, a lot of the water resides uh, with agriculture, and so I am concerned about long-term impacts to soil health from following fields and what you do to those microbes or root zones when you fallow and if or you have to or are required to uh, control weeds and put chemicals on your fields and stuff like that in order to be um, compliant with the demand management program. So, so issues like that. So fallow it, it is not the answer either. I mean, <clears throat> the native prairie was never fallow. Uh, and, and you're exactly right that long-term effects of fallow is, is, is not the answer as well. I mean, there's a, there's a happy medium in there somewhere. Uh, but uh, what we would like to see is, is producers engaged uh, in this process on their own <clears throat> without being forced into it. But there will be a time of reckoning coming if we can't uh, get more on board uh, with that. Steve? Yeah, so this is, this is a good question. And I guess I've heard of that and I just wasn't familiar with the term. But just because you don't have water for a certain time, doesn't mean that you can't plant a cover crop. In fact, it means you should plant a cover crop. And with good planning and designing and selection of your crops, of your cover crops, you can have a successful cover crop out there. You know, for sure, you're gonna have, you're gonna have failures because of uh, improper timing of moisture. But by designing a cover crop, you can choose one that will do better on lower on lower uh, water, on uh, just rainfall, and then also you know you can choose um, those species, but also when you when you plant a cover crop on dry land, you're going to use a much lower seed rate. You're going to you're going to practice soil health appropriately with your conditions out there, so you can and should have cover out there. 
And uh, so I don't think that you should have a, a period where you're not practicing soul health or where you're not having a living root out there. I don't know if that answers the question, but you should, you should never have fallow ground. That is a disturbance. Uh, yeah. Fallow ground is a disturbance to the soil. Yeah, it's especially of concern up here in the upper Gunnison Basin where we really only have one crop. We don't have a lot of ability to change our cropping pattern. We have a short season. We're, you know, above 7,000 feet. Um, so, so thank you. I appreciate your answer. Thank you, Sonia, for your question. Um, I see another question here from Suzanne Mickelson. Suzanne asks, how different is the approach for improving soil health on a small acreage, like 10 acres or less, versus the whole ranch farm management like Jimmy does, or even 20 acres, so 10 to 20 acres versus what you're doing, Jimmy? So to be quite truthful, uh, when I started, I started with one field. Uh, actually, half of that field because I wanted to prove myself wrong on that half. And so I, I done side by side comparison. Uh, and I didn't get into the full uh, farm and ranch until about the third or fourth year uh, when I proved myself in the plots and the smaller fields. So it's very important uh, if you live on 10 acres, take an acre. Uh, I, I never tell anyone to start whole hog all the acres to start with. Start small, learn from that, uh, and, and then grow. It's just kind of like a baby walking. You, you start crawling, then you walk, and then you run. You, you don't start in a dead run. Good question, though. Yeah. And soil health is customizable. Even though the soil health principles are the same for every soil and every, every condition, um, you'll find that when you practice soil health and you play around with it, uh, just like Jimmy was saying, try one acre out, one acre out of 10, uh, you're going to find that you're going to, you're going to manage it the way that you want to. And you're going to try things that work for you. Your equipment's going to be different. You're going to have innovative idea, ideas. You can customize those ideas. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. So, um, it's something that is, that is very individualistic and, uh, and uh, you can do your own experiment. In fact, that should be the way that you do it is, is by experimenting first off. Thank you, Steve. Um, and Susan adds here that she imagines different areas of large acreage do vary like uh, as well as the, uh, like the terrain varies. So I guess that means you would think the different practices within an area might work better on one spot than they would on another. Soil health principles apply uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, and yeah, I mean, different soils perform differently and that's what I was talking about earlier. The better soils uh, in the, the lower ground uh, will regenerate quicker uh, than the highly degraded up on the uh, hills here in, in Western Oklahoma. So. It, it does vary, but the principles still apply. Steve touched on that earlier. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, Heather. Trina, it looks like you skipped a question right above that one. Yes, Jerry Wilm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. Jerry writes um, In northern climates in a corn soybean wheat rotation, we can only have a cover crop after wheat due to the late harvest of corn and soybeans. So, is a crop in the field just as good as, it, as your cover crop? Also, Jerry hasn't liked aerial seeding into standing soybeans. So aerial seeding is a, is a very big challenge. I, I would agree uh, with that. We've tried that here. Uh, you really have to have a rain uh, five or six or seven days after you seed and another rain uh, within a week after that to be successful. So that's a very big challenge in an in arid environment. Uh, some of the things that that people are really doing. Uh, if you want to follow Lauren Steinloggy, uh, he's doing a, a great job of interseeding uh, with drills and uh, in corn and V2 to V4 stage. Um, we also have intercropped uh, soybeans and uh, wheat together. Uh, so there is different ways to do that. It's just getting out of the normal thought process of, of how to do it. Um, 
and just like my corn crop that has the cereal rye growing in it and the, the crabgrass, that was all spread at, at harvest uh, time. So you can have it growing in there uh, as you go along. It just takes a while to get it figured out. But uh, look Lauren Stein log you up. He's done some great things in Iowa in a, in a very uh, tough environment in Northern I in Union City, Iowa. Yeah, and another note on aerial seeding. Um, aerial seeding is not the best way to get a successful stand. Drilling is the best way to get a good soil to seed contact. If you want success and you want to reduce your risk, you have to do it that way. Um, and especially in those, northern, in those northern areas where you have to get a cover crop established well before you start having freezes because the main thing that you want from a cover crop is you want it to be growing robust so that, um, so that it will last through the winter so you can get some cover so you can protect that soil uh, so that you don't have a thin stand of cover crop but you get something up that is a good four to six to eight inches or more before a freeze comes on. That cover crop is then more able to, to uh, withstand the winter, uh, the, the cold winter out there. And then when it comes springtime, it's ready to just jump out of the ground and start producing and putting some biomass on there. So, uh, and Jimmy nailed it when he said uh, interceding. That is, I think that is a key because when you intercede, you know, he said, uh, you know, in the, in the V2 to V4, some people are going to V6, but they're getting that cover crop in the ground. And then shortly after that, that canopy closes over and those cover crops, they sprout and they start growing, but they slow down and stop because they don't have that sunlight. So they kind of sit there and they grow very slowly until you harvest your corn. And then they are ready to take off after that. Um, so that is that's one of the keys right there. If you can incorporate that type of uh, that type of uh, interceding into your crops, yeah, and it's very key. Uh, Steve brings up a, a great point there of interceding it or, or companion cropping. You got to think of it as a companion uh, that is just like a marriage. You you complement one another. Uh, that that cover crop, like he says, growing very slow. It's not trying to outcompete. Uh, the corn crop or the bean crop you've got there is just waiting till it's time to come along and then uh, it shines later. So, uh, and that's all got to be in the thought process if you're planting species and not to be uh, overtaking your cash crop. Thanks, Jimmy. And thanks, Stephen. Jimmy, if you could uh, write the farmer's name in the chat box for us, the, the guy in Iowa, that would, that would be great. And if you have any links. Um, so here's a question from Vanessa Buzzard. Um, Vanessa's working with a soil that has really high infiltration rates, up to 50 centimeters deep. So the water doesn't stay at the root layers as well. Um, so she's wondering if you have any insight on how to better increase water availability for plants at the surface layers. And the soils are organic mulch covered and they do receive regular water and are not disturbed. So how much mulch would be, be on the ground as she considers that highly mulch? Because uh, we see unmute, that- I'll unmute Vanessa so she can explain some more. There we go. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a relatively small area, but the mulch layer is about uh, five centimeters, five, between five and 10 centimeters. Um, so it's, it's a relatively decent mulch layer. I am in arid desert, Arizona. But. So, so that is a, is a challenge. The, the more mulch layer, the more duff, duff you can get on the top, uh, that will help uh, hold that moisture up towards the top. In them, in them sandy soils, uh, I'm assuming that's in that area where you're at, uh, that water rapid infiltration is, is large. Uh, so that's also key to keeping a living root uh, and have a deep rooted crop uh, if down so they can utilize that moisture is down deeper. Uh, and Steve probably has some better comments uh, as well. 
No, Jimmy's exactly right. So when you have these have these uh, arid soils, we we know that they're going to be sandy, and it sa certainly sounds like you have a sandy soil there. So the thing that uh, you may still have that good that that excellent drainage going down there because of the sandy soil, maybe even too much. But the best way that you're going to be able to change that is by making sure you have a robust uh, living root on that soil at all times. So as you're going into the winter, you should have a cover crop growing out there because again, remember what happens when you have a cover crop. You have that liquid organic carbon going down and being and feeding, um, feeding those, uh, those microbes, building aggregates. And as Jimmy said, uh, organic matter holds uh, 20 times, I think it was you that said that, 20 times its weight in water. So the main thing that you want to do is get carbon down into that soil, especially if it's a sandy soil, because if you have that good infiltration, uh, that sand is not going to want to hold on to that onto that water. It's just going to slip on slip on by it. So you need to have that organic matter and uh, uh, building up in that soil, and it has to come from living roots. It's good to have it's good to have that uh, that mulch on top. That is, that is an excellent thing, but you have to go beyond that and you have to make sure that you have a living root on there as much as possible. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we have uh, another question here from Isabel Genesis, and I apologize for uh, mispronouncing your name, Isabel. Um, Isabel asks that, or she mentions that it's, we often hear that it takes a hundred years to build an inch of topsoil. Can you elaborate a bit on the different paradigms? And Steve, you talked about the liquid carbon pathway, why it's important for farms and ranchers to hear about this emerging science. Now, is mm -hmm. it, I'm just gonna unmute you very quickly if you'd like to elaborate on your question at all. Well, it's, uh, good evening, everyone. It, it's been an interesting day, actually, because we spent um, the morning and part of the afternoon learning about soil health with NMSU, and it was a really great day. Uh, Steve uh, also did a presentation there, and um, part of um, some of the um, teaching that was done, one part mentioned that it takes 100 years to build an inch of topsoil. Um, which I, uh, I thought was um, a bit on the way out, <laughs> this kind of view of building soil. Um, so I was surprised to hear that, but I mean, not to um, degrade the, the NMSU um, presentation by any means, it was really a great day and I, I invite everybody to check it out. But so that's why I was uh, wondering, what does it actually mean for farmers and ranchers on the ground that we are changing this paradigm? Okay, so to talk about the 100 years to build an inch of topsoil, you, you know, where they've thrown around 100 years and 1,000 years, I think mainly what we've talked about, and this is something that is, is an older uh, thing that we came up with, it, I think we're talking a lot about the, the breakdown of the geology of the soil. So we're talking about rocks and minerals and the breakdown of those rocks um, to, to build a you know, uh, uh, a texture or a medium that's good for, for roots to grow in. But when we talk about soils that we have now, maybe soils that have been degraded, uh, soil health will start building, uh, will start building soil immediately. And when you start practicing these principles, you can see soil health happening. And so you're gonna be able to regenerate and rebuild soils relatively rapidly rapidly in the dry southwest it's going to take longer when the midwest uh, it's going to happen a little bit quicker but you can see soil health happening almost immediately when you plant your crops or cover crops and you dig down and pull out those roots when they're when they're uh, when those plants are only a couple inches high and you see rhizospheres around those roots you know that that bacteria is being fed so Depending upon your climate and your conditions, uh, soil soil health can happen very quickly. Look what Jimmy showed on with that with that soil sample that he had. Yep, I would agree. It's amazing what you can do, uh, especially after year one, two. Uh, it starts immediately. It's just hard to see, 
because it, it's it's slow, uh, but then that progression gets faster and faster the further you go. Yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Steve. Um, so well, I, I, let, let me let me can I can I quickly say something because I didn't address we didn't address the liquid carbon pathway. It's going to be important because that liquid carbon pathway, as I said, directly affects soil health. In Jimmy's Jimmy's examples of how he has not used uh, synthetic fertilizers. That's huge when you're a farmer. When you're not putting on synthetic fer fertilizers, that affects your bottom line right there and, uh, and your profitability. Uh, farmers and ranchers produce a lot, of, a lot of value, and a lot of that value is lost through the inputs that they're buying, whether it's through equipment or fertilizers or, or medicines or pesticides, a lot of that uh, that income is lost from that. But when we have a healthy soil, we don't have to rely on those inputs to the degree that we did before. So we get to keep more of that, uh, of that, of that profit. And that benefits not only us and our families, but it benefits our communities as well. So that's some of the reasons why it's important to link liquid carbon back to uh, a farmer or rancher's success. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for that. Um extra information about the liquid carbon. I, I think it's extremely important. And uh, thanks, Jimmy, for your answer. We've got one last question in the chat box that we've got uh, just about enough time for, but you're gonna have to give us 30 second answers, Jimmy and Steve. So Dr. Joni Newcomer asks, can you talk about how, how higher temperatures and winds affect the topsoil? And I think this is most specifically in the desert Southwest where we are very hot and dry and windy. That's even more the reason to keep it covered uh, because what we experienced here uh, in uh, Northwest Oklahoma uh, in 110 degree weather, if we can keep a, a good cover growing, uh, even during that drought of uh, 11 and 12, uh, we were able to keep the surface down in the 80s. Uh, and so, you know, that's the main key is keeping it covered if you can get it to grow to start with. Uh, then you can take out the wind and the, the extreme temperature uh, on that surface. Thanks, and Steve. Uh, wow, that sounded that sounded great. But yes, the higher temperatures and winds uh, are going to suck out that moisture. And Jim is exactly right. It, all the more reason to be focusing on uh, keeping that soil covered all the time, whether it's with residues or growing plants because uh, when we have those higher temperatures, we're gonna, ha we're gonna lose our water to uh, evaporation and we don't want that. We want our water to be transpired through a plant. And when we do that, uh, we, we start building that, that healthy soil. It's true that we're gonna have some, some failures when we plant cover crops or we're gonna have spotty cover crops, but that doesn't mean that we give up. It means that we continue to to, to go forward because every time that we make a little bit of progress, we're gonna be able to combat and overcome those higher temperatures better and those windy, the effects of wind better. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Jimmy. Great questions and great answers. It's, it's been a delight listening to you both talk. Um, so folks, I hope you're ready for some bad news. Um, our wonderful presenter, Dave Dubois, will be talking to us about the drought and the outlook. It's not pretty, but he's a great presenter, knows a lot about what we can expect. So uh, without any delay, I'm going to ask uh, Dave Dubois to share his presentation. And while he gets ready to do that, and um, if folks could write in the chat box if there are any soil health resources that you've been enjoying and any soil health resources that you wish you had access to but you don't have access to. And this helps us prepare for uh, future webinars and to serve our clientele and our audience. So here we go. Take it away, Dave. All right. You can hear and see me okay? Yes, we can. All right, thanks for that. Okay, let's get started. Well, like Katie said, uh, yeah, uh, not a lot of good news. Uh, don't throw the vegetables at me yet. Wait till I get finished. Um, so, uh, so where I, I, I've added a map that shows the percent of average 
precipitation over the summer, starting from June to um, what's that yesterday. Um, so you, you all know what's going on. Um, just to, just kind of verification here, percent of average we're seeing um, across New Mexico, um, some areas that are down to 11 uh, in the teens, 15% um, of average to a, a couple little areas where they had a one or two storms that kind of brought them up to average. But by, by large, the Southwest is doing very, very poor. Um, the red over there, um, I mean, this is our dry time of year, but um, we'll see where we're gonna go from here. Let's just, looking at the drought monitor, this was, um, this is last week's, uh, this week's is uh, still being worked on. They remember these are published every week and Thursday they'll be coming out and um, I'm sure we got some changes going on, but look at, um, you can see all that red, the D3 through uh, most of um, uh, Intermountain West, we get all the way out through the Great Basin, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and into also into uh, Oregon. So you, um, a few little po pockets of D4 popping up, but overall pretty poor um, across most of all of the West here. And on top of that, we've got all the fires going on to make everything dismal and um, um, making our sunsets nice and red, but that's the only thing that looks good sometimes. But okay, let's look at a little, um, go cut to, the, cut to the chase in terms of the, our outlook. Um, so latest, we, for, uh, for our seasonal outlook, we, we, we look to the, tropical Pacific to drive our uh, weather systems. So if you can see that little area here. Let me turn on my highlighter. Um, this area right around um, this Nino 3.4 is where we, where we look for for the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, last year we were doing work pretty well. It was above average in terms of temperatures across the tropical Pacific, which was a kind of a weak uh, El Nino, but we've, we've we dipped into the below average cooler water. We had some upwelling of the cool water in, um, from deeper in the ocean and, and that's coming up. And then we're starting to see that in the sea surface temperatures. And uh, that's what we're seeing. And then the upper right is, is what, it's, what we're seeing from the surface. You see that blue below average uh, minus two uh, degrees. Um, we're seeing that. And um, so, but we need to, in order to get, um, a, a real change in the weather patterns, it, the atmosphere needs to respond. So we got to have the sea surface temperatures and then have the atmosphere respond in unison. And, and we actually just, just recently, a week or so ago, we were seeing those things um, um, meet together. So um, we, so NOAA Climate Prediction Center uh, issued a lot, it started out as a La Nina watch, uh, and then it actually, uh, we actually transitioned into La Nina conditions. Um, so this is our probabilities for the rest of the year and into the spring. So you interpret this map. These are probabilities of three different choices. We got either an El Nino, which is a red, a La Nina, which is blue, or a neutral, which is the gray. And then they're grouped into three different uh, months. So the, all the way in the far left, there's uh, August, September, October. SON is September, October, November, et cetera, all the way out to uh, April, May, June. So you can see, um, the highest probabilities right now are La Nina. We're a little more than 70% right now, probabilities. And uh, that's, that should last uh, throughout the rest of the, the winter and into the spring. So we will probably peak up to just, just shy of 80% probability uh, through October, November, December. And, it, and it's, we should be at least 50% all the way out to February, March, April. So that's a pretty sure thing. It, it's, um, right now we're at a um, week. La, La Nina. So um, we'll see how that goes in terms of the, the, the models, but the models are, are showing us we may deepen a little co cooler and then we'll start to transition to a warming um, uh, later in the, in the winter into the spring. Uh, but we're, we're still waiting to see how, how cool we're going to get, how much the upwelling we see, and then the, how the uh, atmosphere responds in addition to some other waves going on like the Madden Julian oscillation to um, kind of um, change things around. So, so what does that all mean? So I, uh, not to belabor a point. So here's, a, I'm going to start short term and go, go long term in terms of precipitation. Uh, I'm only going to mainly talk about precip. We talked a, a bit about temperatures. Um, we, I mean, I mean, at least for New Mexico, like July, August was the hottest on, it was the warmest on record. 
July, August was the hottest on record. June, July, August was the second warmest. And so we're dealing with a lot of stress on our systems, ecological systems. And then on top of it off, we've got not a lot of precip. This is the next seven days. So um, not a lot of help um, looking at it. But if, if, you're, if you're over here in East Texas and Louisiana, um, you've got some tropical systems. You got other uh, things to worry about in terms of flooding. But here in the West, um, not, not much help. So let's look out to, to the six to 10 days. So this is going out to the beginning of October. So basically with the rest of September, which is not that much time, uh, on the left side, warmer than average probabilities and um, below average in terms of precipitation. It's actually pretty strong probability. It's more than 50%. And it's, we don't eat, typically get that much we usually, uh, but it's pretty good probabilities. We go a little further out, um, going out to October 5th, um, still warmer than average, and uh, that that signal of of um, drier uh, signal drier um, of for for most of all of New Mexico, Colorado, going all the way into the Pacific Northwest, going a little farther out, uh, three to four weeks. Uh, this is into the second week of October. Still seeing that uh, warmer than average uh, over pretty much the whole U.S. and and particularly over Arizona, seventy percent probability for above average um, um, temperatures and um, warmer, uh, I mean, uh, drier over most of the, the, the um, continental US actually, look at the see the, and then actually pretty dry over the um, central US there. So let's look out to October. So this is for the month of October. Uh, well, um, pretty much the same scenario, above average temperatures on the left, on the right, we're seeing that uh, enhanced probabilities of below average precipitation centered around um, the, the Southern Great Plains, going most all of Oklahoma, Texas Panhandle, Eastern New Mexico. Let's go a little further out. So there, we're into this, into this time of year now with the maps that the, the, the La Nina starts to kick in. Remember La Nina, we, we, uh, we start to move the, the uh, jet stream further south. Um, and directing the, the polar jet further north. So we usually get a lot less um, storm tracks over the southern tier states. So we're, we tend to expect that. Um, so the dryness start to appear a little more strongly as you go further into the winter time. So then here's the outlook for October, November, December, pretty much that, that's the case. So on the left side, um, it's going to be a warm. It's going to be a warm one uh, above average. Uh, October, November. The probability of above average temperatures is um, um, seventy, at least seventy percent probability, which is pretty strong, um, pretty good. Um, they they know what they, they have a feeling of. That's what the models are showing. And on the right is kind of not what, what definitely not what we want to see. Um, below average precipitation, um, even into Colorado, all the way, all the way out to Southern California, um, seeing a below average for um, the, the late fall into early um, winter time. So one more map, and then just to show you kind of the the, the, the fingerprint of uh, La Nina. Um, this was sort of a, a classic La Nina uh, pattern, um, going from December, January, February. Uh, warmer than average throughout all, all the uh, southern tier states, going all the way from Arizona to Florida, and then um, drier, um, all, same, same areas from Arizona all the way to Florida, below average probability, at least 50% probability of, of uh, drier um, than average. And so this is, uh, the, the Climate Prediction Center is pretty much, even though it's a, um, a, a weak La Nina right at this, this point. Um, we'll have to check back next month to see uh, where, where, what the probabilities are, but that's sort of the trend. We've been sort of seeing this last month. We, were, we saw this um, kind of develop and the models were, were kind of tending toward this. And this is a little more confirmation that, that they, were, they were pretty much on track last month for, for, for predicting this. So it's something that we're um, getting a little better in terms of skill and going out um, uh, more than three months, four months even. So what does this mean for droughts? Well, if you're in drought now, basically you're stuck in it. So, and, and even, um, I know a few folks are from um, Oklahoma and uh, either further west. Um, so um, if you're that chocolate color, basically that you're, you're stuck in here through at least through the end of the year. A lot, a lot of hope in um, the fall precipitation. And if you're in that yellow area, uh, drought development likely. Um, so 
it's still not looking good for a uh, majority of the Southern Great Plains, like a few, few little pockets here and there, but most, most, most of um, the areas in Western um, um, Kansas and most of Oklahoma, it, it's dry now, but most likely gonna get drier. And same way, unfortunately, the same way with uh, California, um, which is the, the, typically, they, that's their uh, cool time of year is when they get rains. Um, I saw that there were um, some probabilities of some uh, atmospheric rivers, but um, I mean, those are far and few between. And we, we may hope for some tropical remnants to pop in and, and come through, but um, um, we, we won't know about those until they, we, we see them boiling off the, um, um, the Eastern Pacific. So um, not a lot of good news. I wish I had better news. So you, you feel free to throw your, um, your, um, your vegetables at me now. So, <laughs> so that's about it. Um, we can check back again in a, uh, another month to see where we are, but that's, I don't expect to see a lot of change um, from, it's just a matter of, um, you know, how much, how much rain are we gonna get between now and, and um, maybe end of October. So back to you, Katie. Thanks, Dave. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box, but uh, people do pipe up if I've missed something. Now, Dave, I do have, to have a question for you myself. Sure. And um, this kind of relates to something that happened a few years ago when we were expecting a very dry winter, and then all of a sudden we got all that moisture in the spring. So I was wondering, you know, the, you've shown us the climate trends, what we are likely to get, but mm -hmm. is there any possibility that we will see a big cold snap just swoop in, say, like 2011? And yeah. Or is there any likelihood of seeing a big winter storm accidentally come our way and dump a load of rain on us? Yeah, I mean, those are all, always, they could happen. Um, those are really hard to predict. Um, we have to look a little more at the Arctic, um, you know, the scene in the Arctic right now. I mean, it, it, it's been, a, a lot of the areas have been above average for, for a while. Um, so, Oh, yeah, we'll have to check back. There's a, uh, a few other indices we can look at and track over time, uh, the Arctic Oscillation, and then also um, dealing with uh, storm tracks. We've got other things that, that, that help out um, that could bring in some um, short-term precipitation. Like I mentioned, the uh, Madden-Julian Oscillation. Um, those are um, the waves that go around the, around the planet that, um, that depending on the, the how it sits with the Pacific, um, um, it, it, they, they could bring in some short-term relief, um, but it's not really expected right now. I, I don't think they really put that into these, um, these forecasts. I mean, they, they, could, they could pop in for short-term for a week, but in general, that, this is kind of our, 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 our path here is this, we, we don't really know about these, these real intrusions of Arctic air, they, they could come in just like that one in 2011. That was, um, we really didn't know that was gonna happen until right, right about a week before we saw that come in. I think maybe two weeks they saw some indication depending on which model, but um, we get crazy weather once in a while, but these are the longer term, these El Nino Southern Oscillation, La Nina El Ninos that they're last a little longer in terms of seasons. Thanks, Dave. Um, I see a question here from Mohammed Omar, and he asks, do you think there was a big climate variability in the region during the uh, last years here in New Mexico? So, have yeah. you, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think, yeah, everybody's looking at these now. I mean, for the, like, what is causing, we've got two years of really bad fires. We've got record warm across the West, and we, we've been looking at this, looking at these uh, patterns, kind of looking at, um, you know, we've got, I mean, as the seasons move, we've got the illumination of the earth. We kind of look at it in terms of the whole system. And um, we're, we've been looking at some of these highs, you know, the kind of the climatology of the highs and how they move. And we, you know, we've got these semi-permanent highs and lows that, that, that position off, that basically steer the storms around. Like we've got the monsoon as well. And so we're, we're, we've been looking at the, the kind of the, the duration and, and strength of like the semi-permanent high over the, the Intermountain West. And it, sometimes it's called the um, Albuquerque Low or the, uh, the high pressure. Um, 
So the, the four corners high is one some people call it. And, you know, and it's, and there's a lot of thought in terms of, you know, the, it's how things are tied together with like to say the tropics and the, the, the poles basically. And so there's, there's been a lot of discussions about, so why, what we're, we're seeing is this high pressures um, basically build and stronger than it's, you know, like there's been a trend of it actually getting stronger in the, in the West. And so there's some thought about, you know, the, um, the, the, the Hadley cell, which is sort of the circulation um, that, that brings up from the equator to the, um, or mid latitudes is starting to get stronger. Um, so, so there's some ideas on that. Um, I think it's still out, out, out for um, more discussion and modeling, but there's, I mean, it sort of makes sense with the, with the warming atmosphere and the warming oceans, we're seeing that some of these circulations get more enhanced. And then what it means for our air is, is, is seeing those, that strengthening will, will mean more um, highs um, developing over our area. So it's sort of that drier become drier. Um, so if you're in that area where high pressure sinking air, that's our area. And so that's not a good sign. Um, and it's sort of one of those clues from a changing climate that we're saying one, one of those thoughts is like, well, if this is gonna happen, this is one of the results. So I hope it's not, I hope we're wrong about it. But that's one of the thoughts on there is sort of that um, the, these permanent, semi-permanent highs changing and sort of the lows steering, the steering, the, the, the storms, the blocking patterns um, happening more, more often. So um, check back again, there's still a lot of discussion on that, but um, doesn't look good. So um, glad you mentioned uh, changing climate. Amy Larson asks here if you can talk a little about climate change with respect to La Nina El Nino patterns. Does climate change favor one over the other or extreme versions of each? Well, they're all tied together. I mean, they're basically, there's going to be circulations that go on, these internal um, redistributions of energy. Um, there's, I've seen papers written on, on both sides in terms of how is it going to change El Nino patterns or not. So um, I don't know yet um, what, what, which side is going to go, but basically it is changing some of the larger um, um, kind of wave patterns with warming temperatures, just like I mentioned with the, that semi-permanent highs are changing, the, the Hadley cell um expanding becoming stronger and as well as the changing the position of the polar jet um so those are kind of big scale things that go on but it it, it, it bottom line it changes the the pattern the timings of things um we're seeing those indi indications um so it's sort of a what what is really causing that we've seen these blobs of really warm temperature over the, the north uh you know the Aleutians and in, in seeing how that those change the patterns of, of uh, temperature on the on the air as well as the the positions of the the jet streams, um, so I mean there's a lot of things that go on um, in 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 it does match the fingerprints of climate change a lot of those it's sort of um, you know yeah we predict it using this model we're seeing it happen so uh, and and it's multiple things um, so it's it's more of as we get to know more about how these things work, we're seeing how things fit in a little more. And, um, and um, so that's kind of a, uh, I, I'm dancing around the issue a bit because we don't know a whole lot about, we're seeing things match up um, as, as they are, as they were kind of written down in papers, but um, I think there's still a lot on, on how a whole system works. But yeah, we're all, we are, bottom line, we are seeing the fingerprints of a changing climate and, and uh, droughts, the durations, the temperatures. We're seeing the, you know, in terms of the, the snowpack, um, less snowpack changing the timing um, and, you know, more, more coming down as uh, liquid and then the temperatures of evap evaporation are changing. So yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot going on in the climate science areas and, 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 and interfacing water and ecosystems, so. Yep. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. And I think um, it's a good example of how we as scientists, we do change what we predict will happen based on new information. And new information is coming our way all the time. And it is, uh, well, I should say new evidence, to be precise. 
So I've got a question quickly here from Jimmy. And he asks, Dave, do you think land use and cover cropping can affect weather in a microclimate effect? Microclimates, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've seen, we, can, we, we actually see those happening. I, I know um, we operate a, a masonette and we, we collaborate with other masonettes across the country. Those are the um, weather station networks. That's what masonettes are and, and spaced out in terms of the spacing of um, tens of kilometers, tens to 50 kilometers apart or more. Um, and we've seen some areas where, um, where, they're, where they're, they, they've added in irrigation that's actually changed the, the, the um, evaporation, the energy exchange in those areas. I, I know they've seen it in uh, California and as well as in some other areas. And you could, it actually did change the, the, the way the um, storms develop and the timing of, so it, it does on a bigger scale and there's been a lot of modeling and measurements to, to back that up. It's kind of like the urban heat islands, another, another um, thing that's a micro scale. You build big cities with covering everything with concrete, pavements, buildings. You're gonna change the circulation patterns and uh, we've seen it happen many times, even in small, small towns, as well as in um, you know, adding um, or taking away agriculture changes the patterns around a lot of areas too. And depending on the, the, the topography, it, it really makes a difference, um, some areas more than others. Um, and the, even in Florida, I was reading a paper about Florida looking at, they, they did a retrospective study of, of, of how it used to look like before um, they did a lot of development and then the actual weather patterns are different. You know, the sea breeze behave differently before development than it does now. You know, there's things like that, you know, which sea breeze makes a difference in the, the, the thunderstorms where they dump the rain and where, where the vegetation starts and where the different types of ecosystems are. So all of those things, there's, I bet there's a bunch of other things that are gonna be discovered in terms of how things work and why, why does this area get drier and which ones get wetter? So yeah, really good question. Thanks, Dave. Oh. And, um, oh, Jimmy, were you gonna say something? No, that, that's good to know, Dave, because hopefully uh, if we can affect bigger areas with soil health and cover cropping, uh, we can have a bigger effect. But I've seen that uh, in microclimate type areas like you talked about. So I'm glad to, that you can confirm that. Thanks. Yeah, and especially like with moisture. I, I know we've, um, there's some areas in the Midwest where they've had uh, dew points in the, in the mid 70s, whereas outside of those areas are much lower. So it's that, that evapotranspiration process going on right there. So it's that, that's that microclimate. Sounds to me like we want to create a new idiom. Instead of saying the rain follows the plow, we want to say the rain follows the drill. Or what if you call that machine that does the drilling? Terrible joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so we are at an end, it's 6.34 now. And um, I just want to echo something that Isabel said in the chat here. She says, bottom line, build soil health with greater resilience to drought. And, um, Hannah also has added an interesting study on new ways to predict drought without using snow melt. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Katie Getz to close us out. Thank you, Katie. We'll deliver everyone to their dinner. We had planned this evening, but uh, well worth it to hear from our speakers. So a tremendous thanks on behalf of the Drought Learning Network to Jimmy Emmons, Steve Cadis, and Dave Dubois. And also to our audience, I noticed we have members from Colorado and Arizona in attendance tonight. So whatever and, channel. And Nigeria. One and one. Nigeria, all, all the better. So whatever <laughs> channel brought you to us tonight, stay plugged into that channel because in the coming weeks, you'll be hearing more from the Drought Learning Network, I'm sure. One last thing in the chat, I'm going to place a link so that you can look back on previously recorded webinars. They are hosted on the Southwest Climate Hub website, so a great place to stay plugged in for future webinars as well. And with that, again, thanks to Dave, to Jimmy, and to Steve, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Good night, everyone. <laughs>